Uh, brothers, thank you very much. I appreciate you, you guys this evening. Once again, uh, this video is going to be recorded and uploaded onto YouTube. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to our senior warden, Mr. Turner. He's going to be sharing his second part on his presentation today as we all have to wait for it. So, uh, Justin, the floor is yours, brother. Please go ahead and share your screen and uh, we can get started. Thank you. Go ahead. Can everybody see it? Yeah, I can, I can see it. It says Masai jurisprudence. I, I, I can see it now, yep. Okay. Um, so this is Masonic Jurisprudence Part 2, um, by myself. Um, as always, the disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed by myself does not represent the views and or opinions of the Lodge and Grand Lodge in which I hold membership or may hold membership in. So, um, basically, we're going to recap, um, basically, uh, what I had talked about um, in part one. Um, what I covered in part one was uh, the three categories of Masonic law, which was the historical slash landmark laws. Um, that covers uh, the landmarks, um, the ancient landmarks that we follow. It covers the ancient charges um, that are given to us. It covers our uh, obligation um, when we are obligated. Um, and uh, those are pretty much what's covered under historic and landmark um, laws. Second, we have our constitutional laws, which covers um, the Book of Constitution, which is given to us by the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the state of New York, um, as well as our lodge bylaws in St. James Lodge number 114. And lastly, the last category of Masonic law is uh, moral laws which is uh, given to us as individuals, it's personal law. Um, but any time that law becomes into question, it is the uh, lodge's responsibility to determine such matters on Masonic law, I mean on moral law. Um, we talked about the beginning of Masonic trials. Um, when it comes to Masonic trials, we should ever be mindful that the only objective of a Masonic trial is to seek the truth. We, discuss, uh, we talked about informal charges and formal charges, and what the difference is between informal and formal charges. Informal charges um, results in no Masonic trial and results in no uh, Masonic punishment. Um, also with informal charges, it's pretty much done in-house. It's done informally. Um, the brother who is uh, the um, accused, accuser, um, pretty much goes to the junior warden, um, informs the junior warden, um, and then the junior warden would handle the situation um, relying upon the direction of the worship master. Um, with formal charges, we learn that the uh, begin the formal charges, formal charges, um, the accuser should um, inform the junior warden as well as the uh, the charges must be um, written on paper. Um, we just talked about, you know, how that should be written. We talked about what should be in uh, that paper, that letter, um, addressing the formal charges. And then that letter must be given to the law secretary. Once that letter has been given to the law secretary, or the charges have been given to the law secretary, it now becomes the property of the law, and uh, the proceedings go forward. Um, also, we learn in Article 27, Section 1 of the Book of Constitution that prosecution for Masonic offenses must be commenced within three years after the commission thereof. So that means that you have three years to, uh, to formally charge a brother um, on Masonic charges um, from the date of when the, uh, the offense actually uh, was committed. So now we're going to continue with Part 2. And the first thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about jurisdiction. We're going to talk about um, who holds jurisdiction over Masonic tribes. So, in the Book of Constitution, in Article 25, Section 1, the Grand Lodge shall have original jurisdiction to hear and determine charges against non-affiliate Masons, controversies between lodges, between a lodge and its master, between a lodge and a member, or members of another lodge, or members of a different lodge. So ultimately, basically what it's saying is, is that the Grand Lodge 
holds um, the original jurisdiction. But when it comes to Masonic trials, and this is something to be unique, because when you look at civilian courts, whether it be um, criminal courts um, or civil courts, mostly the jurisdiction is based upon the type of offense, whether it's in criminal courts or the type of amount uh, that's being seeked in civil court determines the jurisdiction. Um, but here in the Masonic sense, we see that the jurisdiction is given to the Grand Lodge based upon the, the nature of the case. Um, so that's when it comes to the, the Grand Lodge. Also, Lodge does have hold the jurisdiction in trials. Article 25, Section 2, a subordinate lodge shall have with the Grand Lodge concordant jurisdiction over any non-affiliate Mason residing within the territorial jurisdiction of said lodge and original jurisdiction over its members except its master. So now this is kind of interesting because as a lodge, we can hold a Masonic trial but we can only hold a Masada trial um, where we share jurisdiction with the Grand Lodge on non-affiliate Masons. So anything outside of that scope, we as a Lodge do not hold jurisdiction. So if it's a case where it's between um, a brother of another Lodge, well, we as that Lodge do not hold jurisdiction, meaning that it, the, the, the Grand Lodge holds that jurisdiction. But any non-affiliate Mason, if that non-affiliate Mason is within the jurisdiction, or I mean, within the territory of our lodge, we hold jurisdiction. We share that. Now, when that mean, what that means that we share is, is that we do have the right to hold a Masonic trial, or it can be referred to the Grand Lodge. Now, when it comes to the members of the lodge, the lodge has the original jurisdiction. So that means that we do not share jurisdiction with the Grand Lodge concerning lodge members. Lodge members fall under the lodge where the lodge has the jurisdiction to, um, to hold a Masonic trial. And lastly, um, the lodge does not hold jurisdiction on um, charges or Masonic trial um, when it relates to the master of the lodge. So now we're going to go into the net, which now we're going to talk about members of the court. We're going to talk about when we go into a Masonic trial, who plays what in the courtroom. So when you look at it, the first is, is you would have a judge. As we all know what a judge is, a judge must be impartial, and the judge's rule, the judge's responsibility is to govern the proceeding of the, the court case or the trial and make sure that things are done accordingly. In the Masonic sense, the judge is the worship master of the lodge. Um, and this is when uh, the trial is, is on the lodge level. Now, we're going to go to the prosecutor. The prosecutor. The prosecutor um, serves, the junior warden serves as the prosecutor for the law. In Article 64, Section 3 of the Book of Constitution, it states that it shall be the special duty of the junior warden to bring all offenders against the laws to trial. So basically what that means is if you have a brother who's bringing charges against another brother and the, the, the lodge holds jurisdiction, the junior warden would serve as the prosecutor. The junior warden would gather all facts um, regarding to the case and serves the, the lodge as presenting all facts um, in the matter of the case. The correspondent or basically uh, like your court sonographer um, would be the secretary of the lodge. The jury, sir, uh, the members of the lodge serves as the jury. Um, the, the members of the lodge, as we will see later on in the presentation, um, the members of the lodge will um, vote on a guilty or non-guilty verdict 
as well as the members of the lodge will um, vote on punishment for a guilty verdict. And then the last uh, bit for members of the court is the committee to hear testimony. So anytime that testimony um, needs to be given in a case, um, there is a committee that is formed. Um, the committee is appointed. Uh, the members are appointed by the worst master. And the committee should be not less than three, but no more than five members. Now we're going to go into the uh, the actual trial now. So now we know who the members of the, of, the, of the court are. We know, you know, who holds jurisdiction. So now we're going to go into what actually happens when you go into the court, into the trial proceeding. Um, as I stated in part one, the trial must take place at a regular communication. But it may be continued at a special communication called for that purpose. So now the reasoning behind that the trial must originate at a regular communication is, is because the members have to be afforded the opportunity to come to the communication. So the way that they look at it is, is if it's a regular communication, members already know when a lodge's regular communication is. They already have, you know, allocated time to come. If you were to call a special uh, communication, to start a trial proceeding, it could be done in haste and not all members of the lodge would be or have the opportunity to come to the uh, communication for the trial proceeding. But the thing about it is, is the trial just has to start at a communication. If time is going a little bit too long or there are witnesses that you know, that, that you need testimony from that could not make it, um, to that, that trial or that trial needs to uh, be uh, convened at a later time, then a special communication can be, um, can be uh, arranged um, to continue the, the trial process. Um, the trial must be open in the highest degree to which I put the accuser, but it's to the accused has obtained. So if the accused is a second degree Mason, then um, the trial must be on the second degree. If the accused is a first degree Mason, then the trial must be open on the first degree. And if the trial, uh, if the accused is a third degree master Mason, then the, the trial must be open in the third degree. Um, examination of all witnesses must take place in the presence of the accused and the accuser if they desire. So pretty much what that simply means is, is that anytime um, the committee um, that has been formed by the worship master needs to uh, get testimony from any witness, then um, the, the accused and the accuser have the right to be present um, when that testimony is being gathered. Um, the accused may employ counsel for the better protection of his interests. Such counsel must be a master mason. So anybody who is has charges brought against them and they're going through the trial proceeding, they may um, they may have um, counsel, and the counsel has to be a master mason. If the counsel is a member of the lodge, he forfeit his right at the final decision of the question. So that means that if, if the the counsel um, who's counsel of the brother who's being accused. Um, decides to to be the counsel, um, he forfeits his right um, to vote um, when the lodge votes um, for guilty or not guilty verdict and as far as punishment is concerned. So now we're going to talk about if in the, in the trial proceeding, if testimony needs to be taken, how is that testimony gathered? So the way that the testimony is gathered is if the person who has to give their testimony is a master mason, then as a organization, we um, will take their, their testimony on their honor and it will be done in the lodge. Um, the master of the lodge may issue summonses for witnesses at the request of either party. So whether it's the accused or the accuser, if they need somebody to come as a witness, 
Um, they can um, tell the worship master and the worship master can have a, a summons issued um, for that specific brother. Testimony from profane and those that are lower than the, uh, than the accused is to be taken by a committee and the committee is to render their report to the law. If testimony is to be taken by committee, the accused and the accuser has the right to be present. So basically, it's just like I stated before, the, the accused and the accuser has the right to be present um, when any testimony is given. And, um, you know, the, the testimony, is, is how the testimony is given. Now we're going to talk about the conclusion of the trial. So now we've gathered all the facts of the trial. The trial, the facts of the trial has been presented um, before the, the lodge. Um, all testimony has been gathered. The testimony um, report uh, from the committee has been given to the lodge. So now we're going to go into uh, the guilty and not guilty verdict. When this happens, the accuser and the accused must leave the room. Now I will add in this that when I was doing my research, it says that the accuser and the accused must retire. And that, that verbiage kind of works with me because when you say that a brother must retire, um, you're pretty much saying that that brother is retiring. Um, that brother is pretty much, as we know, is going outside the, the, the outer door and may not be returning. Um, so I put just must leave the lodge room because, you know, um, you as a lodge, we may want, you know, the accused and the accused to step out through the inner door to the, to the preparation room, the ante room, um, while the matter is, is, is voted on. And then the accused and the accused may be able to be brought back in um, where the, they can um, then be um, notified of the decision um, from the lodge. Um, so the accused and the accused leaves the room. The master of the lodge will then put the question of guilty or not guilty uh, before the lodge. The vote shall be done by balloting. Um, the vote, that's the only way that the vote can be done on guilty or not guilty is done is by done by balloting. It's not done by a show of hands. Um, the reasoning behind that is, is because the brother may decide that he wants to vote guilty, but may be too timid in front of the rest of, of his brothers to, to vote as he, sees, as he sees fit. So to keep the secrecy of the ballot um, secret, is done by balloting. Um, when we, when it's done by balloting, a white ball um, equals not guilty, and a black ball or cube equals guilty. Um, every lodge member present must vote. Um, and, and you know that's kind of standard anyway it goes. Even when we're dealing with you know lodge elections, um, you find that you know every uh, brother in good standing has to vote, and so this is no different. Um, to declare a guilty verdict, two thirds of the vote are required, and this is something once again that 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 uh, that uh, stuck out to me because um, the wording of this is is not a majority vote; it's a two thirds vote that requires a guilty verdict. So, it just simply mere of a majority does not mean that the person is guilty. It has to be two thirds. And it was kind of weird because I've never heard that. So I had to, to research and find, well, what does that mean, two-thirds of a vote? So the, the best way that I, I can explain two-thirds of a vote is, is, is that you take um, the, the, the negative votes and um, you times that by two, and then that is uh, how you would render. So let's say that you have 30 brothers present. If you have 30 brothers present, in order to have a guilty vote, that means that you would have to have 28 um, black balls um, in order to, to result in a guilty vote. Anything less than 28 will result in a not guilty vote. Um, so that's just, you know, pretty much it. Um, the decision of the law shall be final unless an appeal shall be taken to the Grand Master or the Grand Law. Also, if there is a guilty verdict, then the trial will go into the punishment phase. So now, if uh, the lodge did vote guilty um, on the offender, so now the next phase would be the, the punishment phase. So now we're gonna talk about um, Masonic punishment um, according to this jurisdiction. 
So the first type of Masonic punishment is uh, censure. This is the mildest form of punishment. It means the opinion of the lodge do not approve the conduct of the person implicated. It does not affect the rights and benefits of the party being censored. The censure comes as in the form of a resolution adopted by bare majority on a motion. The resolution may be proposed, but not acted at the same meeting to give time to the party whom the censure is directed to be notified and have the opportunity to defend himself. The lodge at any regular communication can reverse a vote to censure. So basically, that just simply means that if the, the lodge decides to, to vote, uh, if the lodge votes and decides that, you know, the type of uh, punishment for the offender is censured, then um, a motion has to be made and um, the lodge would put to a vote. Um, and if the vote carries, then um, the lodge would draft up a resolution um, just basically disapproving of the brother's actions. Um, second is a reprimand. The reprimand is the next mildest form of punishment. It does not affect the rights and benefits of the offender, must be preceded by charges and a trial, and can be formally communicated to the offender either privately or publicly. If done in private, it is communicated by a letter. If done in public, the lodge room is the proper place and should be given by the master from his appropriate station. The master must exercise his own prudent discretion as to the mode of delivery and form of words. Um, so that's pretty much on reprimand. It, it can be done privately or publicly, and it's pretty much, you know, just reprimanding the brother um, for his, his offense. Um, the next on Masonic um, punishment is, is there's exclusion. Um, exclusion, you have temporary and permanent exclusion. Exclusion is a, uh, is a deprivation of the rights and benefits of masonry as it pertains to a particular law. A trial is not necessary because the rights and benefits of a brother is not affected as a whole on the Masonic level. It may be caused by the master or by a majority of the lodge. So basically, um, with temporary ex uh, exclusion, if, a, if we're in a lodge meeting and if a brother is out of order and the brother is, is, is not, you know, subduing his passion and, and correcting his action, um, the master or the lodge by majority vote um, can have the brother um, excluded um, from the lodge for that communication. Um, permanent exclusion, um, you pretty much find permanent exclusion um, for the penalty for non-payment of dues. It's pretty much striking one from the road. The exclusion brother then becomes a non-affiliated Mason. So it, it once again, it doesn't affect his rights and benefits as a Mason as a whole, but it affects his ability as a member of the law. Um, so that's where it comes with um, temporary and permanent exclusion. Um, the next is suspension. You have definite and indefinite suspension. Article 25, Section 6 of the Constitution, no brother shall be suspended or expelled without a fair and impartial trial after previous service of formal charges. So basically, once again, that's saying that, you know, um, formal charges have to be filed and a trial must uh, proceed for a punishment of suspension um, of definite or indefinite. Um, the sentence of suspension requires two thirds um, of the members present to vote. A brother suspended cannot hold Masonic communication nor receive fraternal relief during the period of suspension. Annual dues are suspended during the time of suspension. Um, definite suspension is for a fixed period of time indicated in the sentence. So if you're a definite suspension, if the punishment was definite suspension, suspension for six months, that brother suspended for six months, then that would constitute as a definite suspension. Um, indefinite suspension um, is for a period not determined and not fixed by the sentence. Restoration may happen by vote at any regular communication with two thirds of the vote in favor of the brother being restored. So if for the punishment, the brother um, is suspended, 
um, but no time um, limit has been put on the suspension, then it would be considered a indefinite suspension. And for that brother to be restored, the brother would have to petition the lodge. The lodge would have to have two thirds vote in favor, and then that brother can be restored. Then lastly, for Masonic punishment, we have um, expulsion. Expulsion is the severest punishment that can be opposed on a Mason. A Mason's Masonic existence ceases upon sentence. The Grand Lodge holds supreme authority and must approve all expulsions rendered by subordinate lodges. So that pretty much means that if a lodge holds a Masonic trial and they vote to um, expel a brother, um, then the lodge must uh, submit that to the Grand Lodge and the Grand Lodge has to approve of the the, uh, the expulsion. Um, the lodge just can't expel, uh, expel a brother. It has to, to be, um, they have to be approved by the Grand Lodge. Now, if the brother is expelled, um, if the brother um, sees that he wants to be reinstored, um, the way that he would go about being re restored is, is that he first must make a petition to the lodge that expelled him. The lodge um, would then um, receive his petition and they would vote by a majority vote at a state of communication to restore him. But in order for that vote to go forward, all members of the lodge must be notified at least 10 days prior to the pre presentation of such petition. So before the petition um, can be presented to the lodge to restore this brother, all members of the lodge must be notified 10 days prior. If the vote carries, then the lodge would send the recommendation with the endorse, uh, endorsement of the seal of the lodge um, to the grand secretary at least 10 days before the next annual session of the grand lodge. The grand lodge reserves the right by a majority vote, vote at any annual session to restore an expelled Mason to all the rights and benefits, but not to the membership and to the lodge. So basically what that simply means is as if the brother goes through the first uh, option and he petitions the lodge and the lodge votes to uh, recommend to restore him and they send it to the grand lodge and the grand lodge approves at their annual session by vote to restore him, then that brother is restored as well as his, uh, he's restored um, with his membership through the lodge. But option two, the brother does not have to petition the lodge. The brother can go through the Grand Lodge and the Grand Lodge holds the right to vote at their annual, se annual session to restore the brother. But if the Grand Lodge decides uh, by vote to restore the brother, the brother is just given his rights and benefits but he's not giving his membership to his law. So in that case, the Grand Lodge will afford that brother a letter stating that he's been fully restored and then that brother has the right to uh, seek membership in another lodge. Uh, continuing on, we're gonna talk about appeals. So this is how appeals happen um, when um, after the trial proceeding um, has been concluded. Um, the appeals, both parties have six months to appeal to the Grand Master or to the Grand Lodge from the, the date that they have been notified of the decision of the Lodge. Um, the party appealing has 30 days after notice of the decision by the Lodge to give notice of intent to appeal to the opposing, uh, opposite party. So they, the, the, the party that's appealing also has to let the, the um, opposite party know that they're appealing the decision of the law. Um, the decision of the Grand Master is final unless a further appeal to the Grand Lodge is given within 30 days after the notice of the Grand Master's decision. So if, let's say, a brother decides to appeal and he appeals to the Grand Master and the Grand Master makes the decision and the brother's not happy and wants to, to appeal it further to the Grand Lodge, that brother has 30 days from the day that he's um, been notified of the Grand Master's decision um, to, to, appeal, to appeal it. 
Um, if the, the appeal uh, goes before the Grand Lodge, the appeal shall be heard before the Commission of Appeals during the session of the Grand Lodge and the decision of the Grand Lodge upon the report of the said committee shall be conclusive upon all parties. So that means that if the, the appeal goes before the Grand Lodge, um, the, the um, part of the Grand Lodge that will handle that will be the Commission on Appeals. They will be the um, brothers who will um, review the, the appeal. They will review all reports um, given to them by the Grand Lodge or the Grand Master. Um, they will then make their report before the Grand Lodge at its annual session. And then um, upon the decision of the Grand Lodge, um, both parties will be um, voted, will be notified. Um, more information on Masonic Trials. Um, this is just more information that I found on Masonic Trials. Article 58, Section 2. When an offense shall be committed by a Mason present while the lodge is at labor, the rules regarding notice of charges shall be dispensed with, and the master shall have power to order the offending brother to show, show cause in standard why he should not be punished. So basically what that simply means is if an offense is committed while the lodge is in labor, so an offense is committed during um, a lodge communication, um, the master has the right to, uh, to, call, to, to call the brother to, to show why he shouldn't be punished. Um, we find this in the opening of the lodge when the worship master says, I now declare the lodge open and in order for business at the same time strictly forbidding all idle and moral or other unmistomic conduct whereby the harmony of the same may be disturbed under no less a penalty than the bylaws prescribed or majority of the brother, brothers present may see cause to inflict. And then um, the last thing I, I found upon was Article 25, Section 12 of um, the Constitution states that charges against a master of the lodge for misconduct while holding the office of master shall be pre presented to the Grand Master or the Grand Lodge. So that basically goes back to what I was stating. The, the original lodge doesn't hold jurisdiction um, over the master. Um, only the Grand Master or the Grand Lodge holds jurisdiction um, in regards to the master. Um, and lastly, I'm gonna talk about arrest of jewels. A lot of people, a lot of brothers don't know about arrest of jewels. So the arrest of jewels, the Grand Master shall have the power to arrest the jewel of the master of the lodge at any time for such misconduct as shall be liable to bring reproach upon the craft. The master of the lodge shall arrest the jewel of any officer of his lodge whose conduct is such as will bring reproach upon the lodge or the craft. And he must make such arrest at any time upon the order of the grand master or the grand lodge. An officer whose jewels have been arrested has the right to have his case heard before the lodge and appeal before the Grand Master or the Grand Lodge. The rest of an officer jewels suspends the officer from exercising any of the functions of his office until restored. The rest of an officer's jewels shall not affect his rights and benefits of masonry. And it shall be the duty of the authority under which a jewel is arrested to restore with the consent of the lodge as soon as their judgment, justice, and the interest of the craft is justified. So pretty much in a nutshell, um, the only person that can arrest, the only brother that can arrest the master's jewel is the grand master or the grand lodge. And as far as lodge officers, whether elected or appointed, the master holds the right to arrest their jewels, and also he must arrest their jewels upon order of the Grand Master or the Grand Lodge. Um, if a officer's jewels is arrested, it just affects that brother's um, role and responsibility in regards to his office. It does not affect his rights or benefits as a Mason. Um, so that's, that's something there. And uh, Basically, that concludes my, my part two on Masonic Trials. Um, for references, for brothers for additive reading, 
Um, I got a lot of this information from the Constitution and statutes of the most worshipful Prince Hall Granddaughters, most ancient and honorable fraternity of three and accepted nations in the state of New York. Um, the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the most ancient and honorable fraternity of three and accepted nations in the state of New York procedure on Masonic trials and the principles of Masonic law on the Constitution law uses and landmarks of Freemasonry by Albert G. Mackey. Um, this concludes um, my presentation. And I now turn it back over to Western Master. Hey, JT. Yeah, man. I'm going to talk that one off, brother. Hey, you got that, that at all. all. That was good, man. Hey, listen, JT, um, solid. Guys, I know that this is a little lengthy, but I'm going to tell you something. Jurisprudence is really important. It is really, really important to understand your rights as a Mason, as well as how to conduct, um, you know, uh, inquiries or, or issues that occur in the lodge itself. I have one question for you, JT, and then I'll open it up for everybody else to have a question. Uh, I don't know which slide you had it on, but it basically stated that if a Mason was requested to be uh, brought in as a witness, uh, then the accuser or the accusee can have that person be requested to uh, be brought in and to be interviewed as a witness, right? My question is, if a person is asked to be a witness and is asked to be interviewed in front of uh, a uh, in front of the lodge, but chooses not, it, it, do they have an option or a choice to not be a witness and to not participate in the trial as a or do they have to because it's coming from the accuser? Or the accuser? So to answer your question, um, basic, uh, basically, uh, if it's a brother, the brother must. Uh, give their testimony because the party will go through the master of the lodge and the master of the lodge will summon that brother and as we all know you must answer summonses within the length of your table show. so if you can't justify that answering the summons is not in is, is, is within is not within the length of your table show, you're going to have to answer that summons now in regards to profanes profanes do have a right that they do not have to um and they do not have to answer. They don't have to come and um, give their testimony. They, they, they don't have to uh, give their testimony before a committee, um, as well as if they don't feel comfortable giving their testimony um, in front of a committee, um, if both parties agree, they can um, give their testimony as in the form of a written affidavit. Um, the, the book on Masonic, uh, the book on procedures of Masonic trials does state that they can, um, does does state that they can give their uh, can give their their testimony in the form of uh, a written affidavit. Beautiful. Thank you. Great answer. I appreciate that, brothers. Please unmute your lines. I'll unmute you guys. Unmute your lines. Any questions you have for our CP? I got three questions for you. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know the demo. You got to take a ticket. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to keep it in my head right now. Yeah, go ahead. Um, first question. Does this own these, the, the way this structure is, does that only pertain to our jurisdiction? Meaning is every jurisdiction, do, do they do it different? Yes, every jurisdiction does it different from the Masonic law, um, because, you know, every jurisdiction does not follow, you know, uh, the, the ancient landmark. So each jurisdiction does, uh, does run different. Um, for different jurisdictions, they can find, you know, how um, their jurisdiction does in science trials based upon um, the Book of Constitution. But everything that I pretty much uh, stated tonight is, is regards to this jurisdiction because a lot of it comes from our Book um, of Constitution and our Book of Masonic um, Procedures on Trial. Okay, second question. When it comes to punishment, is it done the night of the trial or is it done on a different night? As far as punishment goes, the punishment is done. Um, the punishment is done that very night. Okay. Third so question. Right, right after, right after the, the verdict, if it's a guilty verdict, then it go you go right into the, the, the punishment um, phase uh, of the trial. Okay. The third question. If let's say the junior warden is brought up on, on the assigning charges, um, mm -hmm. charges. Who then takes the place of the prosecutor if that happens? Uh, at that point in time, the worshipful master will appoint um, a brother designated to, to serve that role. Um, and, and I would say probably in that in that position, 
they would most likely be a path master who would serve uh, serve that position. Awesome, thank you. Brother, is any additional uh, any additional questions for our senior warden? Uh, yeah, JT, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. All right. So when it comes to the like what uh, Josh was talking about with the junior warden, now let's say the junior warden, the the brother in question, the junior warden actually is the like he actually favors the brother in question and does not want to act as prosecutor. Uh, would that be something that could be done or no? Because it would be unfair, honestly, to the other party. Let's say me and uh, let's say me and Josh are really cool, really good friends, and something happened. I would favor Josh. So it would be an impartial, you know, judgment. Is that something that would be put up also, or it would just be the junior warden and that's it? And that, well, first of all, uh, the junior warden should be impartial anyway as well. Um, I mean, that that's part of, you know, um, your charge as a junior warden. That's part of your... Uh, that, that's, that's what you were obligated as as a junior warden mm -hmm. was to be impartial in no sense and, and to favor beauty. Um, but in the event that a brother just say feels that you know he's not going to be able to be impartial, um, he will relay exactly. he relay that to the worship master, and the worship master will make the, the, the ultimate decision on, on how to handle that situation. Um, whether it's the point um, another brother, past master, um, to serve the laws in that function. I'm good. All right, brothers, any other questions for uh, for our brother senior warden here on his presentation? Oh, sir, great presentation. Yeah, appreciate that. Excellent presentation. Yeah, yeah. seriously, you did, you did, it, uh, JT, you did an amazing job on this one, man. I mean, like we can't we can't say enough how important jurisprudence is, right? It, it is it is a staple of a lot of things we have to go through as masons and. Uh, when it comes to that time, trying to learn all that knowledge at that point is very hard. Uh, but being able to learn it and know it before is also uh, is also very important. So thank you very much for sharing that. I appreciate it.